This is a loaf of bread. And so is this one. And this one. Well, and this is also a loaf of bread. A little too toasted, maybe. But what is bread after all? According to ChatGPT, bread is a staple food made primarily from cereal flour, water, salt and yeast. Or some leavening agent. No, 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 not that one. I meant those. It is prepared through mixing, fermentation and baking, resulting in a cooked dough with a crispy exterior and a soft and fluffy interior. So that's okay, it is clear to me. But that can be all. In the end, this video is what's in bread. There must be something more. Imagine in prehistoric times our ancestors walking around and picking up seeds and crushing them with a stone and mixing them with water and then eating a sort of toy thing. And then someone says, well, things don't have to be done as they have always been done. And they decide to put it on a, on a hot stone to cook it. And we have the first primitive bread in history. She is Pea Echeverria from El Horno de Babet in Madrid, Spain. She also has a PhD and a degree in history. Throughout history, bread has evolved with humanity. We have this, the clay ovens of the Egyptians and we have the first commercial bakeries of the Romans. Both of them had goddesses of bread, as it should be. Throughout history, bread becomes a status symbol. So the rich basically get the finest flour and the poor get the, the worst flour. Really, nevertheless, the biggest impact is with the Industrial Revolution and also with the arrival of baker's yeast at the beginning of the 20th century. So bread becomes mechanized and also you have the arrival of additives. And when that happens, everything changes. And nowadays we've gone back to artisan bread and the use of sourdough. It's been a very long path, but in a way it's been a circular path but it's always had a common essence. Bread as a basic food that brings people together around the world. So next time that you have a piece of bread, think that you're eating a little bit of history and that you are becoming part of a millenary tradition. Bread has always been with us and will always be. Thank you, Bea. Your inputs are always nourishing. So now that we understand where bread comes from, let's take a closer look at what bread is made of. Let's start with its main ingredients, cereals because what we bread without them. Let's talk about wheat. Scientifically known as Triticum estivum, wheat is a plant of the grass family, known for its ears and grains that contain the edible seed we use to make flour. Wheat flour is the main ingredient in most bread recipes, because of its gluten content, a protein that gives elasticity to the dough and helps retain the gas generated during fermentation, resulting in fluffy bread with good volume. Wheat is also an excellent source of starch, which provides most of the energy needed for human metabolism. This means that wheat is not only tasty, but also nourishing. But here is the best part, the diversity. Wheat comes in a variety of forms, from the common white wheat we all know, to red wheat, durum wheat, and even bad wheat which, well, isn't really a wheat, neither a cereal. Each variety has its own unique characteristics in terms of flavor, texture and gluten content, allowing for a wide range of baking possibilities. This process of transforming wheat kernels into flour is an art in itself. After harvesting, the grains are cleaned, dried and milled to produce fresh flour ready for use in the production of bread and other baking products. Now it's time to move to another important cereal, rye. This grain, scientifically known as secale cereale, may not be as popular as its cousin wheat, but it has its own unique charm in the baking world. Rye is a cereal grown primarily in cold, wet climates, making it a popular choice in regions such as Northern and Eastern Europe. It's resistant to cold and its ability to grow in poor soils make it an ideal choice for farmers in adverse conditions. But what makes rye really special is its flavor and its dense texture. Unlike wheat, which has a milder flavor, rye has a more intense, earthy flavor with a slightly sour edge. This makes it a popular choice for those looking for a bread with more character and depth of flavor. In baking, rye is used primarily in the form of flour, which is obtained by milling the dry grains. Because of its lower gluten content compared to wheat, rye bread tends to be denser and more compact, with a firmer and moister crumb. 
but don't let its appearance fool you, because rye bread is anything but boring. Thanks to its robust flavor and unique texture, rye bread is a versatile option ranging from traditional European-style bread, such as root brot, to modern rye bread with added seeds and spices. So the next time you visit your local bakery, I hope you see them with different eyes. In addition to wheat and rye, another common grains in bakings are oats, corn, rice, barley, sorghum, and spelt. Each of these grains brings its own flavor and texture profile to bread goods, from the softness and creaminess of oats to the slightly sweet taste and dense texture of barley. Such as corn or rice are an excellent option for those looking for a non-gluten diet while others, such as spelt or sorghum, offer tasty and nutritious alternatives to regular wheat. In short, cereals are an essential part of the baking world, providing a solid foundation on which bakers can build a wide variety of delicious baked goods, with their diversity of flavors, textures and nutritional characteristics. Cereals offer endless creative possibilities in the baking world. Now we know what bread is made of but we still need to understand how bread is made. Let's dive into the fermentation process, a fundamental biochemical phenomenon in baking. And for that, what better than go to the sources? What is fermentation? In a dough, what we have inside? We have sourdough, we have flour, we have water. And we have the sourdough that has yeast and lactobacillus. What do they need? They need food. food to grow and multiply to generate the carbon dioxide and also all the flavors and the acids. She is doctor in biochemistry, Mariana Kopman, founder and president of the Argentine Association of Molecular Gastronomy, runs a specialized consulting firm and has written several books, including one with me. Where does this food come from? The amylose is cutting short pieces of uh, starch that are sugars. So that sugars are the ideal food for the yeast and the lactobacilli to multiply. That's how we have the fermentation. What do we need to have a very good bread? We need a really strong gluten network that can contain all the gas that it was formed during fermentation by the yeast, all the flavors that been done or expelled by the lactobacilli. We need the starch to build a gel, but the main thing that will sustain a very, very, very good structure of the bread will be the gluten network. We have already seen how to make flour with cereals, and Mariana has explained in detail the miracle of fermentation. But we are still missing one last element, which is really important in bread, the salt. First of all, salt enhances the flavor of the bread by counteracting the natural bitterness of the flour and improving the perception of other flavors present in the dough. It's like the magic touch that makes every bite even tastier. But before we go on, let's unveil a great baking myth. Does salt kill the yeast? I think now it's more than clear. Salt is also master in the art of fermentation. It regulates enzymatic and microbial activity during the crushal process, helping to control the speed of fermentation and ensuring that our bread rises correctly and evenly. In addition, salt strengthens the gluten network that was formed during mixing. It contributes to a more elastic and uniform texture in baked bread. So thanks to salt, every slice you try will be a sensory experience of different textures. And we can't forget that salt also helps to preserve bread, by reducing the oxidation of the fats present in the dough. This means that your bread will stay fresh and delicious for longer. Now that we have seen everything that makes bread properly speaking, let's see how to make bread in detail. The first step is mixing. Mixing is much more than simply mixing ingredients. It's a process in which the dough comes to life, 
developing the structure and texture that makes bread simply bread. The key to mixing is to develop gluten in the flour. This famous protein forms an elastic network that traps the gas produced during fermentation and allows the bread to have a volume and an airy crumb. To mix successfully, it is important to understand some techniques. Autolyze. Autolyze is a technique developed by Raymond Calbell, expert baker and professor at the École Française des Menus de Paris. That consists of mixing flour and water and allowing the dough to rest for some time before adding yeast and salt. During this resting time, usually one hour, the natural enzymes present in the flour begin to break down the proteins and starches which helps the development of the gluten and improves the texture and flavor of the bread. Autolyze also helps reduce the overall mixing time required, resulting in a dough that is easier to handle and shape. Another option that maybe is the first one that you learn when you start baking bread is using your own hands. This is a fundamental process where flour, water, yeast and salt are mixed to form the bread dough. During kneading, the gluten network develops, which provides a structure and elasticity to the dough. This process involves repeatedly applying pressure and stretching to the dough, sometimes very repeatedly, and for a quite long time. Kneading by hand also requires time, patience and practice, but allows the baker to have more control over the texture and final result of the bread. Using a mixer. When we mix with a machine, such as a stand mixer with a dough hook or a more professional baker mixer, the process is similar to kneading by hand but with the aid of technology. The machine does the physical work of kneading the dough, which can be faster and less physically demanding than kneading by hand. During the machine mixing, the action of the mixing hook mixes and knits evenly, developing the gluten efficiently. This makes it possible to obtain a well-developed dough in less time with less effort, which is especially useful when making large quantities of dough, especially in a bakery. However, it is important to know the control of the mixing time to avoid over-mixing, which could damage the gluten network. And now that the dough is perfectly mixed, let's move to the next step, bulk fermentation. Also known as proofing, is a crucial stage in the baking process which takes place after the dough has been mixed. During this phase, the dough is allowed to rest and expand into a single block before being divided into individual portions to shape the final loaves. During bulk fermentation, the dough continues to ferment and develop. The yeast present in the dough consume the sugars and release carbon dioxide, which causes the dough to expand and become lighter and fluffier. In addition, during this resting period, other biochemical changes occur in the dough that contribute to the develop of the flavor and texture of the final bread. The duration of bulk fermentation can vary according to several factors, such as room temperature, the amount of yeast in the dough, and the type of bread being made. In general, it is recommended that bulk fermentation lasts a minimum of a couple of hours to even a day, and in the cold of the fridge. Once the dough has completed its bulk fermentation, it's time to divide it and shape the final loaves. So now we are talking about shaping, which involves giving the dough the final shape we want, the one that the bread will have in the final fermentation. This can include shaping the dough into a ball or bull, batar, one of my favorites, baguette, or any other desired shape. To achieve proper shaping, it is important to work with the dough gently but firmly to ensure even distribution of the dough. Depending on the type of bread being made, shaping may require different techniques, such as rolling the dough, folding it, or even twisting it. And now we have come to the end of the process, baking. And I would say that this is a point of no return. Once we put the bread in the oven, there is nothing more to do, except to wait for the gluten to be with us. All the previous work we have been doing since the selection of the flowers kneading and fermentations ends here and it's left in the hands of the oven. Baking bread is a critical stage in the baking process, where the magic starts to happen. Choosing the right temperature and time not only affects the end result of the bread in terms of flavor and texture, but also ensures that the bread bakes evenly and safely. Let's talk about baking temperature. Oven temperature is crucial for perfect bread baking. For most bread, the oven is preheated to a high temperature, 
generally between 400 to 480 degrees Fahrenheit. This will create a warm environment that activates the yeast and produces a rapid expansion of the dough. This initial expansion is what creates the volume of the bread, also known as oven spring. However, for denser, darker bread, such as a rye bread, a lower temperature around 340 degrees Fahrenheit may be preferred to prevent the crust from burning before the interior is fully baked. Baking times varies depending on the type of bread, its size and oven temperature. In general, smaller and lighter breads are baked for less time, approximately 20 to 30 minutes, while larger and denser breads may require longer baking time, up to 45 to 60 minutes. It is important to follow the recipe and know your oven to avoid burning on the top or edges of the bread. A common way to know if the bread is fully baked is to knock the bottom. If it sounds hollow, it means that the bread is done. A cooking thermometer to check the internal temperature of the bread. It should read at least 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And now that we have the bread baked, unfortunately we have reached to the end of the video. But it is not over yet. I have a few tips for you. Above all, patience and practice. Being an expert baker does not happen overnight. It takes time, patience and a lot of practice to perfect our skills. Don't be discouraged by mistakes. Every bread you can make is a learning opportunity and from the attempts, good or bad, you learn. Don't be afraid to try new recipes, ingredients and techniques. So now you know all about bread. Oh, are you still there? Why don't you go and bake bread? Go, 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 go. May the gluten be with you. Ahora la doctora en inglés. Okay. Sí, me... I want to ah, die. No, yeah. I want to die right now. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, no. okay. Let's do it. Ranging from traditional Europe style bread. Ranging from traditional. Ooh. Ranging, ranging from traditional. In short, in short, cereals are an essential <laughs> appearance of different te of different textures. <laughs> 